Good afternoon, everyone. Um, we've talked a lot, or heard a lot, the last few days about technology in terms of mostly electronic technology. What I'm going to talk about today is introducing um, several speakers who will talk about the new biology. And what we mean by the new biology is this confluence of biology uh, along with information science. Because the breadth of information, the bandwidth is so large now, we really need to do heavy computing to understand the new biology. Uh, the pharmaceutical industry happened after World War II, uh, became quite an amazing and very productive industry for America. Uh, the discovery of uh, the structure of DNA occurred in the 50s, and then biotechnology happened uh, shortly after that with the introduction of biotech drugs uh, in the late, mid to late 80s. The next revolution is happening now, and it's because we're able to deal with large amounts of information, and we'll talk about that on our panel. And our first speaker uh, is Dr. Stephen Quake. Steve? And, and Theo. So Steve is a professor and co-chair of the bioengineering department at Stanford. He's also a Howard Hughes fellow. And Steve's the ideal epitome of, an, of a techonomist. He's taken work from his lab and founded a couple of companies that are involved in understanding this biology. Steve. Oh, Welcome. thanks so much for having me here. Um, <clears throat> Since uh, there's you know, such a strong discussion here about uh, the digital world and, and uh, the digerati, I thought uh, I'd start off sort of reasoning by analogy and talking about uh, uh, how biology is sort of finally catching up to some of those concepts and what it means for doing science. And uh, I'll talk about two technologies, uh, broadly speaking, and, uh, and the way they're affecting uh, biology and medicine these days. And, uh, I'll give you a few examples to sort of set the stage for the discussion we're going to have later. Um, so I think everyone here appreciates uh, the incredible power of, of the electronics revolution and, and the role that integration played in it from uh, the beginning of electronics with vacuum tubes and discrete transistors to the development of the integrated circuit. Uh, the integration allowed sort of unprecedented parallelism and, and the ability to create circuits that uh, were far beyond what one could do out of discrete components. And this was something that engineers had referred to as the tyranny of numbers. Um, they realized that they could design arbitrarily complex circuits, but when it came time to put them together piece by piece, there was some practical limit by which you'd always have uh, a bad component or a bad solder joint or something like that that was uh, sort of this practical limit to any macroscopically assembled system. And Noyce and Kilby solved this problem by inventing the integrated circuit, and it allowed one to fabricate pretty much arbitrarily complex devices by batch fabricating all the components in parallel using lithographic techniques. And that uh, parallelism sort of unleashed uh, our modern electronics revolution. And some of my research has been involved in trying to find the parallel of the integrated circuit to biology, uh, which we call microfluidics, and by analogy, microfluidic large-scale integration. And uh, we're trying to solve a parallel problem in biology, which is called the tyranny of pipetting, um, <clears throat> which is to say, you know, there's a limit to what you can force a graduate student to do in terms of the number of pipetting steps at a bench. And, you know, there's more science. There's science beyond that one would like to explore. Um, <clears throat> and so uh, here's a movie. Forget about the words on this slide. Just look at the movie. This is a picture of one of our fluidic integrated circuits we developed in the lab. The channel dimensions here are uh, roughly 100 microns in size, so something like uh, human hair just below in width. And uh, this is uh, showing food dye being pumped through. And so this device has a number of integrated valves and pumps on it. And it allows very complex fluidic manipulations. And it's something we built uh, for use in uh, structural biology and crystallography. But uh, it serves to kind of illustrate uh, the, the, the power of, of fluidic circuits. And, uh, <clears throat> Our sort of first contribution was to figure out how to make these little mechanical valves that you could put on these chips and then how to do it in a very parallel way. And uh, since we first invented these valves, we've gone on to create devices that uh, now incorporate tens of thousands of valves on them. So it really uh, does approach the complexity of an integrated circuit. And these are 
uh, pictures of several of the microfluidic devices we've made in my lab over the years, uh, or the channels have been filled with food coloring, so you can see uh, sort of the complexity of the design one can do. And it, uh, having mechanical valves really allows one to have uh, the analog, <coughs> or the, <coughs> the uh, yes, well, the analog of digital electronics, uh, so to speak, uh, in that you can decouple design from fabrication. So you can sit there and think about what you want the higher level functions to be, and you don't have to worry so much about uh, the details of how the valves are fabricated. And uh, uh, that's because they function like nonlinear digital components. And, and you can string together pretty much arbitrarily complex sequences of them and know it's going to work every time. And over the years, we've uh, explored applications of this in structural biology, in uh, chemical synthesis, in molecular imaging, in synthetic biology, uh, in uh, various forms of single cell analysis. And, it's been a very powerful tool in our hands, and it's been great for my students. They write these high-profile papers and get jobs and all that. But uh, one of the things you face as an academic technologist is how do you get the technology in other people's hands? And this is, uh, you know, this sort of technology is not uh, like the kind of reagents one would make in molecular biology where you just send someone a plasmid and you can distribute uh, your, your invention. But this requires a fair amount of expertise to make, and. Uh, we try to share it in various ways. We teach a summer school at Stanford. People can come in and learn how to make them. But most people don't want to know how to make them. They just want to use them. And it's kind of uh, the analogy here is, uh, you know, people uh, love to have their cars. Most people don't know how to fix the engines or repair them. They just want to have the car and drive them. And that's the case for many of these biological technologies. And that's been the impetus for me and others who are involved in this on the academic side to found companies to try to commercialize our inventions so anybody can buy them and use them. And uh, so I founded Fluidime some years ago to try to make these circuits, um, which, and if anyone's interested in holding one, I brought a couple along, uh, available for any biologist to buy and use. And the power that comes from that uh, means that you find applications you never would have dreamed of. Uh, I'll show one on the next slide, and another that I got pulled into uh, 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 through a collaborator at Stanford that sort of demonstrate what one can do with this on a more practical level. And so uh, <clears throat> one customer of the company is the uh, Fish and Game Department in Alaska, <clears throat> the State Fish and Game Department. And they actually uh, spend a lot of effort trying to predict where the salmon are going to run. And uh, they do this both to, uh, for the state's economy to help tell the fishing fleets where to go wait to pick up the fish, but also to manage the fisheries so that uh, streams with very small runs aren't going to be overfished. And what they found. Uh, is that uh, since the salmon are genetically programmed to go back to the, to the streams where they're spawned, they've done a lot of analysis of these of salmon genetics, and they can, uh, by studying the polymorphisms, the genetic polymorphisms in the fish, they pick them up out at sea, do a fin punch, and analyze them, and they know where that year's group is going to run to. And they've been able to show that using these genetics, they can really improve their accuracy in predicting where the salmon are going to go. But it means measuring lots of genes on lots of fish. And it's a pretty daunting problem. The customer sent this slide to Fluidime to show all the plates they got to run through to do this. And the reason why they're so enthusiastic about this sort of integrated circuit and biological automation is that uh, it, in a very uh, <coughs> tangible way, reduces the amount of time required, the equivalent amount of time to do the experiments, uh, and even more reduces the amount of labor, labor, and even more reduces the amount of reagents. So you're winning on many different uh, scales by this sort of automation. And it, it, it really uh, sort of enables one to make measurements that, that you know, pretty much weren't practical using conventional techniques. OK, so genotyping salmon is one application. Another one more biological that we've been working on in collaboration with Mike Clark's group at Stanford uh, is to explore the heterogeneity of human tissue. <clears throat> and uh, you know, we've been able to use these chips as kind of a scalpel that lets us dissect the tissue cell by cell and do gene expression measurements of many genes on each individual cell in the tissue. And this has numerous applications, both in basic biology and in uh, uh, medicine in areas such as cancer. Uh, this is a picture of one that we spent a lot of time working on uh, to kind of practice and prove that it works. And this is a picture of the, of, of the crypts you see in, in colon, uh, in one's colon. 
and there, uh, because the stem cells, that sort of, the colon is continuously regenerating itself, and so there's stem cells that drive that, and they start at the bottom of the crypt, and then the cells kind of migrate up as they divide and differentiate. And so there's a very nice connection between the spatial location of the cells and their state of differentiation as they go from stem cell to totally differentiated. And uh, there's a picture of a mouse crypt there that's been stained on the right. And so we've been able to uh, take advantage of this knowledge to really prove that we can use this scalpel to, to dissect uh, the cells and the genes involved. Uh, and then we can move on to cases where you don't have this happy coincidence of, of sort of a spatial separation in other tissues, things like the human breast. And <clears throat> here's an example. Uh, so we've done the normal human breast, and we've also looked at uh, tumors uh, in breast and colon. And here again, cancer is a disease of heterogeneity. And <clears throat> uh, one of the uh, uh, sort of very interesting areas right now in cancer research is this question of whether they're not uh, stem cells for the tumor. Uh, which are the ones that would have this ability to be completely tumorigenic, to regenerate the whole tumor. And they may be a, uh, a relatively small fraction of the whole tumor. And so if you've designed your drugs based on the biology of the tumor as a whole, and you're very good at killing all the blue cells, uh, but you leave behind uh, the small number that are uh, tumorigenic, they can then perhaps be the source of relapse and regenerate uh, the tumor again. And so one would like to have tools that would allow you to dissect the tumors and all their heterogeneity at the single cell level. And so we spent quite a bit of time doing that. And here's an example from a paper we published in Nature last year where Mike's postdoc had gotten interested in whether cancer stem cells are radiation resistant or not. And so this is from uh, a human breast cancer tumor. He separated the cells uh, using various markers. The way to think about this is each row here is a different single cell and each column is a different gene. And the colors indicate the level to which the genes are expressed or not. And on sort of the top half there, are the cells that are non-tumorigenic on the bottom half, the ones that are tumorigenic based on surface markers and so forth. And <clears throat> he did a very nice study showing that in fact these, uh, these non-tumorigenic cells are, are, are killed by radiation very effectively, but the tumorigenic ones are not. They're, radi they're radiation resistant. And why is that? Well, again, by carefully choosing the genes that he was looking at, uh, <clears throat> he was able to show that uh, <clears throat> The ones that are uh, in the black squares there are genes that are associated with uh, scavenging of reactive oxygen species and showing that those enzymes are, are more highly expressed in the tumorigenic cells than the non-tumorigenic gives an explanation for why they're radiation resistant. And suggests so ways to sensitize them if that's what one would want to do. Um, <clears throat> and so this is kind of an example of how we use this uh, cellular scalpel to find genes that are expressed only in the specific subpopulation and ones that are sort of integral to the biology and to uh, one's desired treatment of the, of the disease. Okay, so these uh, fluidic integrated circuits are, are one way to automate biology and they've uh, uh, been very powerful and I could talk for a couple hours on that, but I wanna switch now uh, to another example that's really revolution in bio revolutionizing biology and it's uh, in a different dimension. It has to do with DNA sequencing and genome analysis. And uh, the Human Genome Project was sort of biology's uh, first foray into big science. And you know, I was trained as a physicist, and we physicists uh, were the ones who started big science. And it basically started after World War II with the development of particle accelerators and high energy physics. And it's led to things like this, which is the uh, Large Hadron Collider in, in Switzerland, which is part of CERN and a huge, I think it's a three mile diameter ring that runs underneath the ground there. And, uh, <clears throat> is used to accelerate particles to phenomenal uh, energies and bash them into each other and look what comes out. And this is uh, you know, sort of truly a marvel of science in that uh, it's something that requires not just huge teams of people, but an incredible amount of invention and design. I mean, you just don't go down to the store and buy your particle accelerator. Uh, <clears throat> but sort of in biology, big science, that's what they did. Okay, so the Human Genome Project basically amounted to going down to the store and buying a whole bunch of DNA sequencers and lashing them all together and, uh, and sort of trying to reap an economy of scale there. And that uh, uh, was useful for solving the human genome, but you know, afterwards it, uh, it meant that you know, there was a bit of a stranglehold uh, on this sort of analysis that was held by very small people who happened to be very good at writing grants and collecting uh, the capital needed to do large projects, but it, it meant you had to get down on one knee to you know, sort of genuflect and ask permission to do experiments. And it sort of inhibited creativity in the field, in, in my opinion. And 